it's not just coaches. Um, and it's really difficult because every coach wants or every female coach wants more female coaches coaching. Um, you know, I think there are a number of stories around uh, females having to be asked um, before they will participate. Um, females having uh, played at, you know, state level, not thinking that they're good enough to coach. So it's, it's really difficult. It's a hard sell for me. I, I do recall when I was just coaching under 12s and under 14 reps that I would see all these, um, you know, females that I had coached or, you know, that I knew had been, um, you know, that could play and, and understood the game. And, and yet they weren't putting their hand up to coach. And I physically had to drag a couple onto the court um, because not only does it, um, uh, you know, it, it's also what their daughter sees on court. Their mum is, is coaching. Their mum sees that, you know, she knows uh, what basketball is about. She understands the technical and tactical aspects of, of the sport. So she starts to see her mum in a different light. Um, but I will sort of look a bit broader and look at that system level where um, that takes in those state association boards and committees and coaching appoint appointments. And the first thing I would ask um, any coach on, on this webinar is when you go back to your association, I want you to have a look at job descriptions for committees. I want you to have a look at job descriptions for coaching appointments. I want you to read through it, go through it with a fine tooth comb, but with the lens of, can a female do this? Why or why not? And by that I mean is, if a coaching appointment starts talking about you have to commit to four, two or three day camps um, where you have to travel, is that a barrier for a female coach? If it is, then what are you going to do to navigate that? How are you going to make it easier? Can a, a female coach attend only part of a session? Can she attend for half a day? Can she bring her kids? Can her husband come along um, and, and do the childminding duties? You know, is it okay for kids to be in the stands? Like I'm just, you know, some of this might be unrealistic, but you have to start challenging what, um, I guess, job descriptions uh, for committees, for boards and for coaching appointments to see whether or not this would resonate with a female. What makes it attractive for a female to put her hand up for these roles? The other thing is as a coach, what you can agitate your, um, your board or committees is to ask them for um, an update on the female participation rates for your club the participation rates for female coaches in your clubs. Um, you can ask for the data on the percentage of female uh, coaching at rep level at your association or at your state. Um, and it's only by being a squeaky wheel at times that you will see some change. Uh, so at a board level, if you, if you have one member of the board asking for those stats and perhaps asking for it to be a standing item, then it has to be measured. And as soon as something is measured, then and only then will you see some strategies be put into place. On the local level, there is a lot around mentoring and sponsorship. Now, they're two different things. Mentoring is potentially what, um, you know, uh, in my experience, it's an athlete that I've coached before that is moving into the coaching space and um, you know, just wants to understand the mechanics of coaching. You know, how do I how do I uh, set up um, some prioritization over the season? You know, how do I um, um, how do I do a session plan? You know, how do I make it long term? You know, all those sorts of things. Sponsorship is a different thing. It's finding that advocate within your local association or your state that will be the one that. Um, pushes you further. So they don't actually act like a mentor, they are your advocate. And they're the ones that are saying, hey, I think Chris would be really good in this role. You need to consider her. So there's those two pieces at a local level. One, find a mentor. Two, find a sponsor. 
The other part to that is developing female specific courses. Um, it's, it's interesting if uh, every time I've attended a coaching clinic, I might be one of two females out of 30 participants. Um, whereas, and I think part of that barrier is that um, females would go to a coaching clinic and think that they don't know enough um, and that they will sound, um, sound like they don't know what they're talking about. So they don't put their hand up. Um, a lot of the, the female specific courses that have been run, uh, particularly in Victoria, have been you know, very well attended. The other thing you need to think about on a local level is who is actually presenting their courses? How many coaches, how many female coaches are actually doing the coach education at your club association or at a state association, whether it's a, and sorry, I can't, I can never remember the new um, words for them, but your level one, level two, level three, you know, how many coach, female coaches, educators are there? Um, I guess at an individual level, um, and this ties into uh, what Martha was saying around, you know, fun, adopt a positive coaching methodology. So uh, how many of us really enjoy a rant or rave, rave, raver type coach? How many of us like to be told in front of everybody that we're doing a skill incorrectly? Um, how many of us like to be made aware that, um, you know, we've missed two foul shots in a row? Um, so adopt a po positive coaching mindset. Um, there are other ways to phrase um, what you want or the message you want to give to a young female athlete that they feel safe in their environment. Um, and again, changing the narrative. And this is where, you know, we really have it all over the guys. High emotional intelligence and we're great communicators. So why wouldn't we, as women who are amazing communicators, bring that into the coaching environment? We can describe things better. We can... Um, I guess uh, when we are trying to give feedback, we can potentially do that better. So why wouldn't we make that our point of difference? So I guess, Martha, would you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, it leads actually into my next Look, you, Chris, we're, we're, we're following <laughs> each other, so this is good. It leads really well into my next um, point that I was going to make. So, Jared, if you don't mind going to slide 16, I can actually um, give the coaches some checklists to follow that um, following on from what Chris said. So here are just some practical tips that maybe to look out for. Um, and that you may want to try and maybe some of them don't resonate with you. Maybe some of them you've tried already and they've worked or not worked, but I, I would love it if you could just take away a couple of things off these two slides to, to give it a go. So in terms of new players, I guess that's when girls are telling us they're their most self-conscious when they turn up new to the environment. So, you know, selecting a, another female buddy from the group to support that person can really help as well as providing a female role model within the club. It doesn't have to be from that team. It can just be someone within the club. It can be a player, a ref, an administrator, anyone that just checks in on um, the female players that they can relate to. I definitely would not have that role model as a selector. It needs to be someone that is um, never involved with selection but can build up really good rapport and relationships with the females within the club and they feel safe to go and talk to them um, about anything at all. And I think, I think that's a really helpful point for all players. Um, when, when you're, I guess, running with a new team or new players, the emphasis, again, there's that fun word with lots of a variety and the importance of the health benefits in the training sessions and not on the physical benefits, which I'll touch on in just a second. Females need reassurance that authoritative coaching style is not going to help retain the females. They need to be told what their strengths are and what they're doing well. 
the last thing that they want to be told in, in front of everyone is what they're not doing well. An idea that's been successful, and I know it's running into my third question about what do other sports do well, but that is about conducting clinics um, at local schools for girls so that they can try it in an environment where they feel safe. In their school environment with their friends um, is a really good way to segue them across into your club. Um, encourage all girls and women, definitely that clothing um, requirements is, is an issue. Um, and the best way to get around it, and many sports have been so successful, is to actually ask the girls, what do you, what do you feel comfortable wearing? What do you not feel comfortable wearing? And that can be just an anonymous survey monkey that you send out with a couple of questions. Um, uniform is a big thing to girls. It needs to fit the right way. Um, it needs to be the right size. And that whole tucking in the, the shirt, again, what Chris mentioned, is it definitely an issue for some girls. If the shorts are too tight, if they're white and see-through, um, they can be huge barriers for girls to participate in sport. So little information, bits of information that might be seem small but have a big impact uh, even around the colour. Please don't give teenage girls white shorts. You know, we need to ask for their feedback and make sure they're dressed in a uniform that fits them in the way that they want to, that they feel good in. Um, and the staff comments or coach comments to girls really around performance. And that's where there's some interesting research in about the way talk to boys as opposed to talk to girls. And with boys, the coach comments, the research shows tend to, to be around their performance and quite often, unintentionally, or with, with the best intentions actually, they're often around appearance for girls. So for example, hey, you're looking so fit as opposed to you're running really well or you're shooting really well. So having those comments around performance for girls um, would, would be very, very positive as opposed to appearance. Just on the next slide, Jared. Um, as mentioned, the authoritative coaching style has shown to be quite unsuccessful with girls. It's about a collaborative style, communication, uh, trust, empathy, open-mindedness, and really displaying compassion and support, particularly if something goes wrong, um, and focusing on that player's strengths and building up the confidence, because at the end of the day, we actually want the athlete to feel really good at the end of the session so that they continue to come back. Um, also, a thought around... <laughs> I mean, this is, this is going to depend on what level the girl's playing at. But certainly in terms of the commitment, the time commitment. Mm -hmm. Is your club, is your association, is your coach flexible? Are there options? If the girls can't make it on one time, are they able to go another time that week? How flexible are we really for these girls? And is it realistic if we don't give them any flexibility at all that we expect them to continue in the sport when the time commitment is huge? Just a question. I don't know how practical it is, but certainly flexibility around commitment is something to consider. Um, and again, that social aspect, asking the girls, talking to them, what is it that you want from sport? I mentioned the music and training sessions. Girls, the older girls coming in, maybe running a session with them and mentoring those girls. So I think some of those strategies um, would really help and relate to girls. Chris, did you want to add something there? Look, um, I wanted to also say that um, sort of having family and friends around is normal as well, that it's they're not mutually exclusive, that you don't have to come into an environment I mean, um, your parents come and watch you play. Um, there's nothing wrong with kids watching you come to coach as well. Um, so I think it's just sort of, um, I keep talk, mentioning it's about changing that narrative, um, but definitely um, asking the girls what they want is, is always key. 